Great to see everybody tonight. I want to open your Bibles, if you would, with me to Deuteronomy chapter 3. I'm going to start there in just a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 3. I want to share kind of maybe a, an interesting analogy, at least interesting to me, and maybe if it is to you, uh, wonderful. And if it isn't, just humor me and act like it is. But, uh, but I want you to go over into Deuteronomy chapter 3. Just, just want you to think with me for a minute about what, what I might kind of qualify here as a pretty sad scene. Moses has, has spent his life trying to, to be the man of God that, that God would want him to be. He, he's a reluctant servant, right? You remember that scene there at the burning bush, and God appears to him and says, Listen, Moses, I need you to go back and lead my people out of the bondage of Egypt. And Moses, for in paraphrased form, basically says, Lord, I, I'm not really the right guy for that. And he gives him a list of excuses as to why. He would be the wrong person for that. God gets kind of frustrated with him and says, listen, if you don't think you can talk well, I'll, your brother seems to talk pretty good. I'll send him with you. He can go along and be the mouthpiece that you need from time to time. And, and, and God sends him into Egypt to lead the Israelites out of that bondage. And, and we know things didn't go great for him. We know that there were challenges along the way. There were difficulties. The people were rebellious and, and, and created challenges for him. Every time God would do something for them, whether it be the manna, that wasn't sufficient. We need some meat. We need some, so the quail come, right? And, and, and the, the waters, if they, if they provided by God, they were too bitter. Or they didn't, there were always something, right? There was just always something that the people of God just seemed to always complain about. And Moses, after hearing complaint after complaint after complaint, finally reaches a point in his life, where, in, in this process, where he's fed up and he transgressed what God desires from him. And because of that moment of frustration, and, and I suppose in some senses because he chose to take glory and honor from, away from God, God says, Moses, you're going to have to bear consequence for that. And the consequence was he wasn't going to be able to go into the promised land. All that effort and time that he put forth, all the energy that he used in order to try to lead the people to appreciate this wonderful home that God had intended for them and to lead them to this promised land that flowed with milk and honey, out of all that time and effort, it comes to the point now where Moses isn't even going to be allowed to walk in and see that place for himself. And we come to Deuteronomy chapter 3, beginning in verse 26. And we learn that the Lord was angry with me, Moses recalls. He says, the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough. Side point, by the way, can you imagine hearing direct from God, enough? <laughs> right? I suppose every dad in the room's probably had a moment like that where the children need a little sternness, maybe a few mothers as well, and you're just like, Enough. And that's what God says to Moses. Listen, I've heard your complaints. I know you're upset. I know that you're blaming the people. I know you don't want to accept accountability for this. I get it, but enough. I've made my decision, God says. And you can continue to beg, but it's not going to benefit. It doesn't matter at this point. I've made my decision. Speak no more to me of this matter, he says in verse 26. Go up to the top of Pisgah. And lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. Here's the point I want you to recognize. I don't know if it, just think about it personally for you. I, if it was me, I don't know that I'd want to see it. I'd work so hard to get the people to be able to inherit this wonderful promised land. I'd work so hard to get them into this land that God had intended for them. And now because of my transgressions, because of my accountability, God has decided I'm not going to be permitted to walk into that land that I had led everybody else to. Now remember, he's not the only one that's not going to get to see it. There's a whole generation of fighting men that aren't going to be able to see it as well because of the transgressions of the people. And Moses is caught up, caught up in that situation. So God says finally to him, listen, enough. You're not going in, but if you want to see it, climb up on Pisgah and look out over it. Look to the north and the east and the south and the west and, and look and see all the land that I'm going to give. But command Joshua in verse 28 and encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go before over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. And here's the analogy I want you to draw from that tonight. 
There are a lot of people that that's all the glimpse of heaven they'll ever get. There are individuals that all they'll ever really appreciate about heaven is not a realization of it, not an experience of it, not being able to reside there for eternity. They simply get glimpses of it and they're able to see it, but never appreciate it enough, never want it enough, never desire for its benefits enough to actually do anything about it. And so my challenge before us tonight in our study is this. Simply, I don't want to see heaven from Pisgah. I don't want to just look from the distance and hear what the Bible says about it or hear others talk about it. I want to be there someday. I want to walk into the home of my Creator. I want to reside in the house of God for eternity. I want to go to heaven. And I so that sounds so simplistic, right? I know that sounds so simple, and yet it's so true. At the end of the day, all I want is to go to heaven. And why I stand in this pulpit today before you is because I want as many people that I can convince to go along with me as well. And brother and friend, there might be all kinds of reasons men choose to stand in pulpits and preach, but I, I, I encourage any of you that might do that from time to time, and I encourage any and all preachers that I spend some time with to appreciate that if our effort and goal isn't to lead people to the heavenly home of God, we're missing the point. The purpose of study, the purpose of understanding God's will, the purpose of appreciating the testimony of the Scriptures, it's for a purpose, and the purpose is to get us to heaven. I want to be there someday. I don't want to just get glimpses of it and see it from a distance or see it just on the pages. I want to experience and live there someday. But yet so many before us have had great opportunities that they have squandered away and just got a glimpse of what they could have experienced. Let me share a couple of examples of that with you tonight. Go over into Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And just write a familiar text. Agrippa is not a unfamiliar. In fact, we sing a song based on him, right? There's an invitation song we often say, Almost Persuaded. It's based right out of this history that comes from King Agrippa here in Acts chapter 26. In verse 24, notice that he said, Now as he thus made his defense, this is Paul, by the way, and they've accused him of all kinds of things, and he begins to make his defense as to the realities of the circumstance. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Quick point, by the way, friends. Anytime you preach the truth of the gospel, there's always going to be somebody who thinks you're crazy. It's been going on for a long time. My point isn't to try to distract you. I'm just trying to get you into the reality of it. It's been going on since the days of Paul the Apostle. And so if Paul the Apostle stands before an audience of men and one of them steps up and says, You're crazy. Much learning has made you mad. I don't even know what you're talking about, Paul. If it can happen to him, then don't be shocked when it happens to us. There will always be those naysayers, but just speak the truth about how it is that we can gain heaven. Just speak the truth about what God's Word says about it. He said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, verse 25, but speak the words of truth and reason. And here's the fascinating part of the story, to me anyway. So Festus, right, he's the feisty one. He says, oh, you're crazy, Paul. None of this stuff is worthwhile. And he, Paul says, no, no, I'm not mad. In fact, I'm telling you truth, and I'm giving you reasons to think about. And then he fixes his eyes on the king. And he looks at Agrippa. And he says, for the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his intention since this thing was not done in a corner. What Paul's basically saying is, listen, I'm just talking to you about Jesus, and you just ask the king about it. He knows all the truth about it as well. I'm not telling you anything that isn't public knowledge. The things that happened to Jesus were public knowledge to that audience of people. Everybody knew what happened. Everybody in that day and time that were experiencing and things that are in and around Jerusalem, they all knew what happened to Jesus. And there were a multitude of witnesses to not just the events relating to His crucifixion, but a multitude of, of, of those who were witnesses of His resurrection as well. And so Paul just looks at Agrippa and says, listen, none of these things that I'm talking about happened in some vacuum somewhere. They were all out in the open. You believe it? And then he asks him the question, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And I love Paul's confidence here, right? He doesn't even give him a chance to answer. He says, you believe the prophets? I know you believe the prophets. That's kind of the way he says it, right? 
Well, you think, Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know you do. I don't even know why I'm asking you that. And then Agrippa says to him, verse 28, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa can only see heaven from Pisgah. He's just not fully convinced that he ought to do anything about this information and knowledge that's been given to him. He understands the truth of it. He understands what the prophet said. And by the way, it's not insignificant that, that Paul points him to the prophets, right? Because what did the prophets do? They tell us about the coming of Jesus. They tell us the things that would happen in and around the life of Jesus. He would tell us where he would be born and how he would live and how he would conduct himself and the various aspects of his death. And those prophets speak clearly and Jesus fits the fulfillment of those things. And so Paul looks at Agrippa and says, listen, you're not unfamiliar with this knowledge. You're not unfamiliar with the history that the prophets had shared concerning Jesus. I know you're a believer. But the problem is he couldn't get his eyes away from his earthly power and influence. And he claims, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I've heard all kinds of variations on that, by the way. I don't know how to exactly say it. Was he being sarcastic? Was he being honest? <laughs> it doesn't really matter in the end run, right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what his reasoning for only on being almost persuaded, the end result is the same without being fully convinced and persuaded in his mind to do anything about the truth that had been revealed, he's going to be on the outside looking towards heaven from Pisgah. He'll be looking at the promises of God from the outside and never being able to fully experience them and appreciate them and, and know the glory of those benefits and promises because he's not fully persuaded to do anything about what he knows to be true. In Mark chapter 10, let me show you a different example of the same kind of situation where here's, here's a guy and it isn't knowledge, it isn't, it isn't his ability to understand, it's just an unwillingness to commit to getting away from just glancing at eternity and glancing at the kingdom of heaven and actually committing to the things necessary to receive it. Verse 17, Mark chapter 10. Now as he was going out on the road, and speaking of Jesus by the way, one came and running and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Great question. I wish everybody in the world would ask that question, right? What should I do to inherit eternal life? What is it that I should do in order that I might reap the benefits of heaven someday? What is it that God's asking of me? That's a great question. And you can't get to the resolve without asking the question. But the point is, when the answer comes, am I going to receive it? When the answer comes, am I going to receive it? I want to go to heaven. I want to see heaven. I, I love the, the glory of heaven. And so I ask, how do I get there? Jesus says to him, verse 18, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. By the way, that's not just some kind of, of side thought that Jesus is trying to illustrate. What he's trying to say to this man is this. You have referenced to me in the same manner men speak of God. And if you have ascertained in your mind that I am the only begotten of the Father, then how are you going to respond to the things I'm sharing with you? Jesus uses this man's own knowledge to try to lead him to appreciate that whatever Jesus instructs him in, he ought to listen to. Because the man's already connected Jesus to the Father. And so he says, verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And I also always envision, and again, I suppose this is speculative, but, but I almost envision kind of the man cutting Jesus off, right? You know, the, you know what we often refer to as Ten Commandments, right? It's kind of how he's rattling them off. And you almost hear the guy go, yeah, 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 right? The question was, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus starts quoting the Old Testament law to him. And some of those fundamental things that are part of that law. And so he answers and responds to him in verse 10. Teacher, all these things I've done. In fact, I've been obeying those rules since I was a kid. From my youth, I've obeyed those things. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. 
Friends, love speaks truth. Love always speaks truth. We talked about that earlier in the week in different kinds of settings, but love always speaks truth. It tries to do it with grace. It tries to do it with salt. It tries to do it in ways that people can understand it and appreciate it. It tries to do it in ways to not be a discouragement, but, a, but an edification. All those things are true, but love always speaks truth. And when Jesus hears this man's response, how obedient he's been to those, those commands of God, how, how instructive those had been to him all his life, he says, I've done all those things. Jesus looks at him with love and says, one thing you lack. Love tells the truth. This man is still only seeing heaven from Pisgah at this point. He only understands the Old Testament law. He has yet to embrace the things that are coming in Jesus. And so Jesus says to him, you've got some other things. Go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And verse 22 tells us he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now I don't officially know whatever became of him after this moment. I'd love to believe that maybe his senses came to him at some point and maybe he later responded to the God. I don't know, right? But I know in that moment he decided that his possessions were more important than the eternal life that he'd asked the original question about. He made a decision that the earthly blessings were far more important to him than the eternity that he had asked about in the original question. Remember, that's how this whole conversation got started. Jesus didn't go to this guy's house and drag him out and start preaching to him. This man came to Jesus. And he asked Jesus, what should I do that I might inherit eternal life? So Jesus answered. You've done a great job following the commands and instructions of the Old Testament. What lacks is simply this. You need to disconnect from all those earthly things that you're trusting in. Come take up your cross and follow me. And the man says, I'd rather see heaven from Pisgah. I'm leaving. He went away sorrowful because he had so many possessions, the text says. He didn't want to give them up. Friends, this earth ties us so often. It connects us in so many ways that there are a lot of people who never, ever get any more than a glimpse of heaven. They never become attached to the promises that are surrounding it. They never appreciate what's necessary for the inheritance of it because the attachment to this world is just too strong. And they only get glimpses of what God really would want from them. In Matthew chapter 26, there's another example I can share with you. In Matthew chapter 26, pick up in verse 14 with me if you would. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14. Then, then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Lord willing, tomorrow night, I want to talk a little bit more about that aspect of that betrayal and what Jesus went through. But for tonight, I just want you to simply focus on the idea of what a privilege it had to have been. It should have been for Judas to have had all that personal time with Jesus. You know, I, I've met some folks in my day who said, well, if, if I could just encounter Jesus in some kind of very direct and personal way, if He would just come talk to me, if I could have some kind of very direct and, and, and specific kind of connection to Him, then I'd be a believer. And, I, and I'll say to them again, maybe, maybe not. There were all kinds of individuals who had direct connection to Jesus who didn't become full believers. There were all kinds of individuals who had contact with Jesus, got to hear Him speak, got to hear Him preach, got to witness the miracles, and still didn't commit to it. Judas Iscariot here abused the very opportunity that he had to be with Jesus. If there should have been anybody on the face of the earth, those 12 men should have got it, right? Of all the people that walked upon the earth, of all the people that, that should have understood it, that should have had their eyes fixed on heaven and wanted to be partakers of it, it should have been all 12 of them. But here's a man who had every opportunity. But yet it happened. 
I know folks, and we, we use all kinds of phrases to describe it. We talk about, about folks that, that grow, grew up in the church, right? We use that phrase. In other words, they were brought to church. They were taught in Bible classes. They came to services. They heard hundreds and hundreds of sermons. They had access to all of these things, right? And they still choose to see heaven from Pisgah. It's not that they don't know. It's not that they don't understand. It's not that they just choose... They choose not to honor it. And just for me, just as sad as it is to see Moses standing, and you can almost envision the, and, and feel the sadness of that moment as he looks out and he, you, can, you almost see the tears welling in his eyes. As he realized what it was that he had sacrificed for so little. As he glimpses up or out over the promised land and realizes that he doesn't get to become a partaker of it. Men like Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. And, and, and I've often thought about this text and, and you I'm sure have read it before. But, but Paul's begging Timothy, right? When he concludes this second letter to him, he says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Timothy, I need you to get here. I need you to get here. Why was that? Well, he said, verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, and only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. It's kind of interesting, right? Because that's the same, I believe, the same Mark, John Mark, that had left Paul earlier. On the first missionary journey, if you recall, Barnabas and Paul had taken John Mark with them, and he, and he left them on that journey, and when they go to decide to take the second missionary journey, if you recall, Paul and Barnabas have no small dispute over whether John Mark should go or not. And Paul didn't want to take him because he needed to have people he could trust and have confidence in. But, but I want you to appreciate by this stage when he writes to Timothy here in this moment, he's actually complimentary to Mark. You bring him with you because he's helpful for me because Demas has left me. And the, word, the wording in the King James anyways, and New King James as well, is, is that he, loving this present world. Now, I've often thought about that. We, we, maybe, maybe it's worldliness, maybe it's just the things of this world were more appealing to Demas than the cause of Christ was. Maybe that's what he's trying to say. Maybe it just wore him out to think that every town he goes in, anytime you're walking around with Paul, your life's in danger. You know, we'll use that phrase, guilt by association. Well, if you walked around town with Paul, <laughs> most likely a hornet's nest is going to get stirred up and you might be right in the middle of it. And maybe Demas just, just he loved living. <laughs> he loved his life. <laughs> and I, and I, I don't know whether I'm ready to die for this or not. I don't know whether I'm ready to make that kind of sacrifice. I don't know whether I'm whether, ready to give up self even though Jesus challenges all of us to, de <coughs> excuse me, to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Him. Too many individuals. We could have kept going. I'll leave you with those four. Too many individuals, and you could probably find some in your own lives and what you've encountered, and people that you know, that, that for whatever reason, they, they, they just become so enamored with something other than heaven, and they quit. Last night, we spent our entire service sermon time last night in the book of Hebrews, and we talked solely about the idea that God challenges us not to quit. Why? Because I want to go to heaven. I, I don't want to just see it in descriptions. I don't, I don't want to just think about it. I don't want to just ponder about what, how great it is. I want to go there someday. And I don't want to be like Agrippa who's just partially persuaded. I want to be committed to it. I don't want to be like that ruler who wants to hold on to his own possessions and can't make sacrifice in order to see Jesus. I certainly don't want to abuse the privilege and opportunity that's been afforded to me by so many that have encouraged me and edified me and taught me and led me. And I don't ever want to love this life more than eternal life. I don't want to see heaven from Pisgah. Be, 
because the view from heaven is so much better. Not just a glimpse, not, not, just, not just looking, but, but, but think about the realities of it. Jump into the book of Revelation with me. I, I'm just going to spend a few minutes with you tonight. There's a whole host of things we could talk about. I'm just going to, I just want to spend a little time with you and looking at how God describes this home that He's promising us. In Revelation 21, beginning in verse 18. When John reveals to us what this heavenly home looks like, he says that the constructions of its wall was of jasper. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. I am told that you can refine gold to that point, where it almost has a transparent look to it. And, and, and so the imagery here is that the gold of heaven is the purest of pure. Refined to where it almost just looks like clear glass, he says. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, and the third uh, chalcedony, and the fourth emerald. And he just keeps listing them all the way through the twelfth. And then in verse 21 he says, The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. <laughs> It's hard, right? It's hard to wrap our brains around that. <laughs> it's hard to wrap our brains around streets of gold. We'd just take a few paved ones once in a while, right? <laughs> a non-pothole road would be great. <laughs> but heaven, heaven's got streets of things that we would never think, that, that have so much value. We'd never think about putting that on a road. Why would you put that on a road? It's too precious. But in heaven, even the most valuable things that we think of would, would be street material. Every jewel imaginable is seen in the, here. And there, here's these 12 gates. And obviously, there's, there's significance in that description, right? And we can have a debate some other time about the literal and figurative and symbolic. And you know, it is kind of interesting that sometimes we talk about the book of Revelation from symbolism when we talk about the numbers and the dragons and the, and the various... But when it comes to heaven's description, we want all that to be real, right? I, go home and think about it. But, but, but I think what John's trying to do is just to get us to see the beauty of it. And, and the gates here, right? The, the, a gate made out of a, a single pearl, he says. And not just one, but 12 of them. But in all that earthly kind of description, there's a, there's a more powerful reason to want to go to heaven. There, there's, a more, there's a more powerful reason, and that is its, its inhabitants. In verse 22, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The beauty of heaven is you don't have to go somewhere to worship God. You just worship God because He is the temple. They don't go like they did under the Old Testament law to Jerusalem and make sure they trek there and go worship God. And it's no more of that kind of thing. God is just the temple. He, his, his heavenly home is the temple of worship. It is, it is it's the epitome of a place to worship and honor God. I saw the... Almighty God and the Lamb as its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. A, a place that doesn't need any artificial illumination, God just lights it up. The same power of God in the beginning when He said, Light be, or let there be light, and there was light. He doesn't even have to speak it into existence in heaven. He is just there and He brings its light. And Jesus brings its light. I'm going to go to heaven because that's where God is. I want to go to heaven because that's where the Lamb of God is. I want to reside there because that's their temple. That's their home. That's where we can worship Him. 
It doesn't even need the sun or the moon because the glory of God illuminates it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There, there should be no night there. What I love about that phrase is simply a disconnect between earthly things, right? In earthly terms, they had a lot of walled cities. And so he's describing to them something familiar. A city that has walls, a city that has gates, a city that, that has various infrastructure within it. And so they're kind of getting this imagery. But in the midst of that, he says it's got gates, but they never shut them. <laughs> there's, there's no reason to, because, because God is its protector. There's, not, there's no force. There, there's no enemy. There, there's nothing that can, that can challenge you in that place. You don't have to shut the gates because, because there's nothing that can harm you there. And there's no night when they would typically shut a gate of a large walled city. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it that they're there shall be no, by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. I want to go to heaven because God is its glory. I want to go to heaven because of the beauty and grandeur of that, of that great place. And I want to stay focused on the fact that I want to be there because that's where God is. I, I, I encourage you to be, to be cautious to not over to over-earth heaven. Uh, what do I mean by that? I, I talk to a lot of people, and they envision heaven as like, if, if they like to golf, then heaven's just the most beautiful golf course you've ever seen. If they like to fish, it's nothing but the greatest fishing holes that you could ever imagine. Right? If for some odd reason you're a Cleveland Brown fan... Right? We keep putting these earthly kinds of kind of... No! No! Heaven is a place that He built to His, to His specifications. And what makes heaven great isn't because it brings us back to earth. No, it's great because it gets us out of here. It takes us away from this place to a place far greater than anything this earth could offer. And God is there. In John 14, Jesus was trying to encourage His disciples to know that He was going to prepare a place for them. And He said, in my Father's house, and in the King James language it says, in my Father's house are many mansions. And, and I'd encourage you to maybe think about that a little differently. The word mansions that gets translated in King James there is generally translated rooms in other translations. And why is that significant? Here's why I believe it's significant. Because we get this image of heaven like we all get a mansion. And, and I live on Price Road, mansion number 2062 over there, and you're in mansion over here, and you're in a mansion. No, 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 no. I almost called this sermon, at least this back half of it, I, I'd rather have a room in the house of God than a mansion over the hilltop. Now, I'm not criticizing the song. Sing the song. I get the song. It's a perfectly fine song. I'm not anti-mansions over the hilltop. Don't go out here and quote and say, Price said that you can't sing that song. <laughs> but you get what I mean? I, I want to live in a room in God's house. I want to go to heaven to be with God. I want a room in His house. Because that's where the glory is. That's where the worship is. Not, not my own place down the street. When I want to go to heaven. I want to I be there. I want to be there when that, when that gathering occurs. Look at verse 11 of Revelation 7. All the angels stood around the throne. Can you imagine that? The Bible talks about how, how Jesus could have called legions of angels, thousands of them. Sometimes we sing the song, He could have called 10,000 angels, right? 
thousands of them. And here they are. John says they're all around the throne. And the elders are there. The four living creatures. Friends, don't get hung up on the symbolism. Notice what's happening. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. On a couple of occasions in my life, I've had the, the, the privilege of being in large assemblies of people, hundreds and hundreds of people, to just sing. To just sing. It's spectacular <laughs> to hear four, five, six hundred voices blending themselves together and just singing praises to God. But you know, as good as it can get, you could pick the best song leader that, the, that we could ever find. He could pick the greatest songs ever written, and we could assemble the 600 best singers the church has ever heard, and it won't sound anything like that's going to sound. It won't sound anything like that. I want to be in that place where they worship God, world without end. I want to be in that place where all the things of this life are done. I attended a funeral of a gentleman I knew. Did not conduct that funeral. But it was kind of an odd moment for me because the guy conducting the funeral made a comment within his lesson about how many funerals I had done. <laughs> Hundreds. Hundreds. It, it's it's mind-boggling to me. I was commenting the other day to a couple folks we were talking to on Sunday. When, when I was in Moundsville for those 14 years, 55 members. That, that was, and that's, that was just those 14 years and only members. That wasn't the cousins of members and, and friends of members and the folks at the funeral home would call and say, can you come down here? And then the calls that I still get to come back and go. It, hundreds. And, and, and t I, I promise you, there are days where I, when I see the caller ID, I, 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 just, I just, it's wearisome. But here's what gets me through. This is what gets me through. The reminder that all of that someday will be gone. Someday it will all be gone and, and I want you to notice, I'm sure you've caught this before, but remind yourself of it. Verse 7, chapter 2. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There's no death there. Why? Because God says in this real or picturesque, you decide, but the beauty of the fact is God says, in my home I'm giving you access to that which I denied Adam and Eve. They had been given access to the tree of life, remember? Until they chose to listen to the serpent. Until they chose to look elsewhere other than what God had instructed them. And he puts them out of the garden because he did not longer, no longer wanted them to have access to that tree of life. How does man gain access to that tree of life again? He's got to get to heaven because that's where it is now. I don't, I don't want to weep the tears anymore. I don't, I don't want to go through the sorrow anymore. I don't want to mourn anymore. I don't want all that, the pain and the difficulties and the hardships. I want to escape all that. The only way to do that's here. The only way to do that's here. And when I transgress God's will, when I step outside of, of His desires for me, it should hurt because I've decided to go up with Moses on Mount Pisgah and just take a gander at what I know could be but miss out on the great opportunity to spend my eternity there.
Can I encourage you tonight to not miss out on that? Can I encourage you to appreciate the rest and comfort that ultimately comes? Can I get you and I to realize that that after all these labors and challenges and things that we experience in this life, there is rest. I don't, I'm not a... I tried to take a nap today. The phone wouldn't quit ringing. Isn't it... Right? Sometimes you just do. You just, you just, you just need to rest. It's, it's nice to just put everything aside for a little while and just breathe. That's what heaven is all day long. The peace and rest and comfort of God. I don't want to miss that. I don't want you to miss that. That's why I wanted to come back. Why did we talk last night? Don't quit. Why? Because I want to go to heaven. Why do I want to go to heaven? Because that's where God is. That's where Jesus is. That's where the light of God is. That's where His temple is, where, where He's worshipped day, all day long. And there is no night. It's where this tremendous audience of believers will be someday. I want to surround the throne of God with the angels of heaven. That's that. I want to go to heaven. And Lord willing, if we're able to come back tomorrow night, I'm going to tell you what price was paid in order to get us there. I'm going to close, Lord willing, tomorrow night and talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because without of that, any of none of us can get there. Don't quit on God. Why? I want to go to heaven. How do I get there? Jesus. And the redemption and the reconciliation He provides. But if you're ready right now to step into those promises, if it's time to quit gazing from Pisgah and start living as one who is saved in Jesus Christ, one who has experienced remission of sins through baptism, has had those sins washed away, maybe you need to step back into that. The difference between you and I is we might stand on Pisgah for a little while, but God invites us to come on down off the mountain and come into His promises if we'll choose it. Moses didn't have that option. God's judgment against Moses was done. He said, I'm done talking about this matter. Take a look at it, but you're not going. But so long as you and I have breath in our bodies, so long as you and I have, have life in us, we have opportunity to make the choice. Will you make the choice tonight? Will you decide tonight, I want to go to heaven. I want to honor Jesus in order to get there. If we could help you or encourage you or strengthen you in some way to make that commitment and make that a realization for you, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?